video number two this week, and so this is the election of 1800. We're going to talk about the Jefferson and the Madison presidencies. So in 1800, let's see, John Adams was president from 1796 to 1800. He's going to run again uh, because Washington was president twice, so why not Adams, right? And so he's going to run against, uh, Adams is going to run against his vice president, Thomas Jefferson. Well, this is going to be different because this is really the first the first election where it's very, very clearly it's political parties, the Federalists versus the Democratic Republicans. And there is going to be some mud slinging, some trash talking, and it's not going to go well for really either side. Ultimately, Thomas Jefferson is going to win this one. Uh, and then the person who gets the second most votes is Aaron Burr, who's going to become vice president. Where do you know Aaron Burr from? Oh, yeah, he's a little bit. We'll get there in a little bit. Um, all right. Now, we call this the revolution or the election of 1800, but some, sometimes we, we hear it as the revolution of 1800. Why, why would somebody say that? Well, because w we have one political party which has diametrically opposed ideas from another political party. And so a Federalist is stepping down and a Democratic Republican is stepping into the big chair and nobody got shot. Nobody got stabbed. Nobody was assassinated. Adams walked out the door. Jefferson walked in the door. The rest of the world said, wow. I wish we could do that. So it was a bloodless revolution. The revolution of 1800. Thomas Jefferson, president number three. Man, this guy. Yeah. I'm a big fan myself um, of, of Thomas Jefferson uh, uh, and his intellect. Um, and so, let's see. Spoke several languages. He edited the Bible because, uh, in fact, the, uh, the Jefferson Bible. I picked that up at Monticello, his house. Uh, he had nothing better to do, so he decided to go through the Bible and edit out all the stuff that he couldn't prove scientifically. And you see that. His Bible is a little uh, thinner than the normal Bible. Um, he founded the University of Virginia, obviously wrote the, de uh, the Declaration of Independence. He was very pro-France. He was a slave owner, but he opposed, philosophically opposed slavery. He's going to have a very famous quote that talks about, uh, we have, we have uh, we, writing on the wolf and have it by its tail. If you're riding on the wolf of slavery and, you, and you have, you, you've grabbed it by its tail, if you let go, the wolf will eat you, but if you don't let go, then you're still riding on a, a wolf. Um, and so he didn't, he didn't have a solution. Um, and yeah, we could talk all about Sally Jennings and, or Sally Hennings and, and, and uh, his slave and whether they had kids and all that kind of stuff, but eh, we're going to move on. Design Zone Home, my so uh, you can go there today and go see it. Uh, it's, a little, it's kind of a museum. You can walk through it and see all sorts of cool little inventions because he did it all. He was an inventor. He was a musician. He was a philosopher. He was a scientist. He was a writer. He was a, uh, he, a botanist. He did it all. Oh, and he was president, too. There, uh, you can see his uh, tombstone, and he, he, uh, he decided what was going to be on his own tombstone, and it says this. Here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, author of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia. Doesn't say anywhere that he was, you know, President of the United States, Vice President of the United States, Secretary of, Secretary of State, or, you know, any of that other stuff. But that's interesting. He, he chose to leave that out. Pursued a moderate course, uh, talking about Jefferson, pursued a moderate course. He, he tried. He tried to get everybody on board. Once he was elected, he knew that half the people didn't like him, all the Federalists, and so he was like, no, no, we're all Federalists, we're all Republicans, we all, we're all Americans. He tried. Um, he was successful a little bit, not so much. Sought to downplay the, the, uh, the differences between the rich and the poor. He wanted to try to push everybody towards the middle, uh, try to make it more uh, democratic, a more democratic society. Well, he tried. He, he was definitely pro-farmer, not, he wasn't anti-manufacturing, like anti-North, but he was definitely pro-South. Um, wanted a very limited central government. So, first thing you do is you cut military spending. Uh, he didn't want, he didn't want to have a, well, let's see, 
Cut military spending to eliminate debt. Okay. Um, we're going to have a new Secretary of Treasury because <laughs> he, he's not keeping Alexander Hamilton. Uh, he kicks out, he, uh, Hamilton leaves. Hamilton's going to go to New York. Uh, he has a new guy in here, and his new guy uh, gets rid of gets rid of some of the stuff, but leaves some of the policies that Hamilton uh, has. We're going to get rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts that uh, Adams's groups passed, and we're going to get rid of the whiskey tax. The Judiciary Act of 1801 and Marbury versus Madison. I'm going to I'm going to reserve that for uh, for video number three because that story all by itself. Oh man, it's such a good story, and it's really important. So I'm going to make that a separate video. It'll be about 15 minutes long. I say that. We'll see. Uh, all right. So Jefferson he cuts the military, and then immediately we have a situation down there in the uh, uh, in the Mediterranean. So we call this the Barbary Pirates. The Barbary Pirates. Uh, let's see on our map here. The Barbary Coast. So we've got some uh, some uh, ne'er do wells, some uh, crazies down there, and they're and they are uh, intercepting ships from all the European nations, but then also American ships. So Jefferson sends the Marines, and that's why we have from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. That's right. And you didn't have to pay anything extra for me to sing that to you. Um, let's see. He had eliminated most of, the, uh, most of the, mo the money for the military because he didn't trust, talking about Jefferson, he didn't trust standing armies. A standing army is an army that's a permanent army. And he was like, you know, that's how, I mean, he's read world history. That's how dictatorships form, is that you have a permanent army and they're not doing anything, so eh, let's just go take out our own people. Right, so he didn't like that. However, when the Barbary states attacked, Jefferson realized that he had to, he had to have some Navy, some Marines, and there you go. So we get a peace treaty in 1805, and that does show that we can stick up for ourselves. Good for us. Louisiana. Secretly, Napoleon had negotiated with Spain and they got Louisiana back. So the last time we saw a map, everything, everything to the west of, of uh, the Mississippi was Spanish controlled. Well, now it's back under the hands of uh, France. So, uh, that was in 1800. A lot of people weren't happy about this, actually including Jefferson. Remember, Jefferson's pro-France, but he was like, eh, see, Spain, when Spain owned the land, I mean, really, Spain, they were really, really important in the 1500s. But since then, they've pretty much, they've kind of gone away. And so they owned that land out there, and we weren't really worried about it, because Spain. But now that France owns it, and France is a pretty powerful little group, and plus this guy, Napoleon, he seems like he knows what he's doing, and so... That kind of, it made everybody kind of worry. Well, Jefferson, Jefferson looks at it and says, okay, what to do, what to do. One of the things that the French did was they immediately, uh, remember the Mississippi River, we, all the farmers are sending their stuff down the Mississippi River and then out and then back around to New York or wherever, Charleston, wherever. Um, and the, Sp the Spain, in Pickney's Treaty, we, they, we had made the decision that, or Spain had made the decision not to tax us. Well, France is going to reverse that. France is going to tax our ships to come down through there. <sighs> Jefferson was not happy about that. So, Jefferson is going to come up with a plan. Meanwhile, the plan happens in one slide. Meanwhile, uh, Haiti. So, uh, Haiti, just that little bitty island out there, not that far away, you know, over there by Cuba, you know, right there. So Haiti owned by France. While the French Revolution was going on, some Haitian slaves decided to take advantage of this. While the French were dealing with what they were dealing with over there in Europe, the Haitian slaves decided to rebel. And between the Haitian slaves and a whole bunch of nasty little mosquitoes carrying yellow fever, a lot of French troops that were on the island of Haiti uh, 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 are no longer on the island of Haiti. And so Haiti, Haiti declares independence under, the, under Toussaint Louverture. So they claim independence, and Napoleon looks at the map, and he realizes that from point A to point B, point A being France, point B being uh, the port of New Orleans and or Louisiana, uh, Haiti is between point A and point B. So 
to get to get from a, point A to point B without passing by Haiti, and it's just you know. Uh, so Napoleon says, maybe maybe I don't need Louisiana that much. Maybe I don't need Louisiana that much. Jefferson, he's he's all freaked out about us paying these taxes going down through the Mississippi River, so he sends uh, James Monroe to meet with Robert Livingston, who's over there in France, and they're going to have ten million dollars. They're going to go to Napoleon. They're going to say, Napoleon, can we buy the city? The city of New Orleans, we want to buy the city because of, you know, and $10 million. Hey, Napoleon, $10 million right now. You're fighting all these people in Europe and uh, $10 million, man, that'd go a long way, wouldn't it? I mean, $10 million, right? And just for the city. And Napoleon said, no, thank you. And we were like, oh, this is not good. And Napoleon said, counter offer for $15 million, not $10 million, but $15 million, you can have Louisiana. And I'm sure Madison, I'm sorry, Monroe and Livingston were like, how much of Louisiana? And, and Napoleon, I'm sure, was like, uh, all of it. Like, all of it. For $15 million. All of it. Monroe and Livingston, they did not know how to respond to that. So they came back and they told Jefferson. Now we have a situation. Do you remember the National Bank? And Jefferson says, we cannot have a bank because it's not in the Constitution. And Hamilton says, we can have a bank because it's not in the Constitution. This is we can't. Strict construction, loose instruction. Well, guess what it says in the Constitution about buying land? <laughs> Nothing. So Thomas Jefferson, a strict constructionist, his viewpoint is, if it's not the Constitution, we can't do it. Therefore, we can't buy Louisiana. Now, could we buy New Orleans? That's the argument. We can't buy Louisiana because the Constitution doesn't say we can. But look at that deal. $15 million for all. I mean, we're going to get like 13 states out of this eventually. $15 million for 13 states? And Jefferson's like, ah. okay, guys, make the deal. But we're going we're gonna to put this on the on the on the down low. Don't make a big deal out of it. Don't put it out in the newspapers, you know, just, you know, no big deal. Jefferson actually comes up with an idea of, hey, let's pass, we could pass a, uh, we could pass a constitutional amendment. The United States has the right to, ba to buy land. But then Jefferson realized that, I mean, it takes forever to, to do that, to pass an amendment. He was afraid Napoleon was going to take back his deal. So Jefferson went ahead and bit the bullet and totally went against his philosophy about strict constructionalism, and he bought Louisiana. You know Alexander Hamilton's like, what? Hey, there's a, there's a Jefferson over there puking up, puking on the uh, Constitution, uh, a little Napoleon stinging him in the butt. All right, moving on. Louisiana doubled the size of the United States, guaranteed access to the Mississippi, and there you go. Eight. 128,000 acres. We could spend we could spend an entire day on Lewis and Clark. So instead, we'll do one slide. So uh, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark are going to be assigned by Thomas Jefferson to go out and see what we just bought. That's right. We bought Louisiana without actually knowing what was out here. So, and I say here because where I'm standing right now, we're it's kind of part of Louisiana uh, of the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, so he's going to send these two guys out with a, with a group of guys, We're going to, and they're going to explore Louisiana. And Jefferson said, all right, here's the rules. We need you to find a water source that connects the Mississippi all the way back to the Pacific Ocean. That would be great if you could do that. Now, the group had no idea that the Rocky Mountains were in the way, but eh, they're about to find out. So they're going to start north. They're going to start in St. Louis. Oh, the St. Louis Arch, the gateway to the... Okay, so anyway... Um, they're going to start off, and they're going to go. And Jefferson not only wants them to find point A to point B, but he also wants them to collect, collect scientific stuff. So if you see a new tree, get me some leaves. If you see a new animal, capture it and send it back. If you see a new type of rock, grab it and send it back. And Lewis and Clark were constantly, 
cataloging things for Jefferson and sending back trunks and suitcases and briefcase full boxes full of stuff for Jefferson to look through because again Jefferson he just likes that stuff uh, we know the story says that uh, at some point they're going to run out of people who speak English as they as they're coming across the United States right across Louisiana to purchase and um, a lot of people out there speak French, so we have French interpreters. Well, the French interpreters, some of them know some of the languages, the, the Native American languages, but as the further the further you go west, the less languages that the that the French interpreters know. So they run into um, uh, this French trader. His name is, his last name is Charbonneau, and so he's married to this very young girl named Sacagawea. And there's 19 different ways you can pronounce Sacagawea. In fact, I think in William Clark's diary or Meriwether Lewis's diary, he writes her name like 14, 14 or 15, 16 different ways you can, he spelled her name. So we don't really know how it's pronounced, but Sacagawea, that's what I'm going to go with. A uh, young uh, Native American girl, she was a Shoshone, uh, Shoshone Native American, and uh, so she spoke some languages, and then also French. So... Oh no, she didn't speak French. She spoke s several Native American languages. So when they started going to, across the West, she, uh, she would come up to a tribe. If she spoke their language, she would communicate. Then she would turn to her husband, who spoke Shoshone, and then he spoke Shoshone in French, and then a French interpreter would interpret that into English for William and Clark. So it was like the telephone game back when you were in kindergarten. You played the, you know, whisper into somebody's ear, and you keep going all the way up, back and forth, back and forth. It was a pretty crazy, pretty crazy thing. You know, there's lots of stories. Golly, there's so many stories about the Lewis and Clark expedition. They split up, and then they magically found each other. They had the, you had the, the big slave. Uh, uh, York was was the slave, big, tall uh, African American, and and uh, many of the. Uh, tribal, the, the chieftain said, hey, we'll help you out if that guy will uh, 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 um, hook up with some of our women so that we can have nice, big, strong uh, babies. Crazy stories, crazy stories. The short version is they got to the Rocky Mountains and they went over the first mountain and, they saw the, and then they saw the next big mountain. They got over, the, over that and they saw the next big mountain, which is even bigger and bigger and bigger. And they're like, whoa! And then they got to the Pacific, uh, Pacific uh, Ocean eventually over there in Oregon, claimed Oregon. And interestingly enough, uh, as far as I know, as far as my reading and my research, the first time that the United States of America had a... A, a vote where it was equal suffrage, equal for everybody. All the slaves and all the women, everybody got a vote. So this would have been 1804, the winter of 1804-05. When they got to when they got to the ocean, they got there onto the beach there in Oregon. They had a vote: should we turn around and go back right now, or should we hang out for a little bit and wait for the the winter to go by so we went, we're not going over the mountains in the winter? And everybody got a vote. No, that's not true. Second was pregnant. She had a kid, a little kid, Jean Baptiste. Uh, he did not get to vote. But everybody else did, all the women, her, and all the slaves, uh, York. And then everybody else got to vote. So, hey, democracy. Um, so we got to explore it. There you go. And feel free to, to read up or, or, or YouTube some of their stuff. It's kind of cool. Speaking of crazy things that happened in American history... The Vice President of the United States and the former Secretary of Treasurer, they really hate each other in New York. I mean, like Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, they really, really hate each other for lots of different reasons. But the short version is Burr wants to do X and Hamilton says no and blah, 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 and well, they're going to get into a little fight. And so back then, you know, you insult somebody's mama, your mama's so fat that and then and, and oh yeah, I challenge you to a duel. You know, a lot of duels back then were just to save face. And so if you had one pistol or two pistols, then uh, when the person says go and you take your steps and you turn around and you fire, you fire into the ground. And that way you could say, well, I shot it, but I, w I don't actually want to kill this guy. But we made the point that we could have killed each other. The story of Aaron Burr, Vice President of the United States Aaron Burr, and former Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton, 
they're going to have a duel. Well, dueling is not allowed in New York. It's not allowed in New Jersey either, but in New Jersey, they don't really prosecute. So they cross the river into New Jersey uh, one morning. Do I have the date up there yet? July 11, 1804. And uh, they're, going to, uh, they're going to have a duel. They both have, uh, they both have uh, pistols. And they had arranged it such that their, the people that came, the witnesses that came, would have uh, culpable de uh, deniability. So everybody who was there uh, had their backs turned, which unfortunately that means that nobody saw what really happened. And that the people who rode them across on the boats, the guns were inside a chest so that when the police showed up, they can say, oh, I didn't see any guns and things like that. So they, everybody had culpable deniability. Um, the story says that when, uh, when they got there, Alexander Hamilton got to choose uh, the side, you know, up, up the hill or down the hill to the left or the right with the sun in his eyes or whatever. He got to choose the side, and then they went. Now, there, when, when it was time to bang, bang, they heard two shots, and different reports talk about the, how the, the distance between the shots with regard to time, the time interval between the shots. Some say it was pretty quick, and some say it wasn't quick at all, and some say it was there was a bang, and then there was a very pregnant pause, and then there was another bang. And so it just depends on uh, which account you read. Regardless, um, Alexander Hamilton's shot hit the tree high above uh, Aaron Burr. And we find out later that uh, Alexander Hamilton had written a statement uh, before the duel, he had written a statement, written a letter that said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not aiming at him. I'm just there to save face. I'm not going to shoot him with my first shot. And if he shoots towards me, I might not shoot him at the, with my second shot either because I don't want to kill the vice president of the United States because, you know, he's the vice president of the United States. Aaron Burr uh, shot him. I mean, he shot Alexander Hamilton. He shot him right above the right hip. The problem with that is that, you know, the little, the musket ball, it hit him in the hip and then it started to bounce under and around and then eventually into his lumbar vertebrae. And so, uh, yeah, bad, bad news. Alexander Hamilton um, immediately fell down. So the shots were fired. The seconds, the guys who were there to watch, they turned around, saw Hamilton on the ground. They rushed over them, rushed over to him. Hamilton's like, yeah, um, that's bad. I'm going to die. Um, the, the friend of Aaron Burr grabbed Burr and hid him behind a, an umbrella so that uh, onlookers would come up. They saw Hamilton on the ground, but they never saw Burr. They never saw the vice president because he's hiding behind an umbrella. Again, everybody knew who did it, but it was culpable den deniability. So when the police show up and the police go, hey, who shot, shot you? No. Did anybody see Burr? No, nobody saw him because he was behind an umbrella. Ooh, it's weird. Uh, but there you go. Alexander Hamilton dies in a duel with the vice president. <laughs> it's just weird for me to say that. Can you imagine? Yeah, okay. Burr's going to become, uh, well, he's famous for that, obviously, but uh, he's, now on, he's now on the run because, you know, he shot and killed somebody. And uh, he's going to decide he's going to start his own country out here in Louisiana, and that's going to all fall apart for him. Uh, he's going to be eventually picked up by the police. He's going to be uh, thrown under the bus by, Louisiana, by the governor of Louisiana. And he's going to be put on trial for treason. Now, interestingly enough, you thought, I mean, shooting somebody, uh, you know, former, the former uh, Secretary of Treasury, you think that would be treason. But Chief Justice John Marshall said, no, that's not treason. Treason is when you commit a crime against the United States of America. Alexander Hamilton was just one guy. He wasn't, you know, he's not the United States of America, so it's not treason. Note to self. Britain and France are going to continue to get into it. I mean, like when, so far in these, in these powerpoints, they've always been in. Uh, let's see. The Battle of Trafalgar, the Battle of Austerlitz, the British own the sea and the French own the ground. And it's going to continue. And so we're talking about Napoleon Bonaparte, right? And we know that he's going to do really well for, another, for at least another uh, six, seven, eight, fifteen, uh, ten years here. Uh, so the United States, we're going to follow. We're going to follow George Washington's lead. We're not going to get involved. We're not going to get involved. We're going to declare neutrality, right? We're going to get, declare neutrality. Unfortunately, Britain is going to pass their Orders of Council of 1806, which says 
if there are any ships out here, any ships out here uh, that are going to other countries other than us, we're going to sink them. And so that's like American boats are going to be sunk. And the French are going to pass the same thing. They're going to pass a rule that says, if any boats go to England, regardless of who they are, we're going to sink them because they're our enemy. And the Americans are like, wait, what, what? We're neutral. Why are you guys sinking our boats? On top of that, the British are continuing to impress us. Again, not by magic tricks, but by taking people off our boats and doing what they do. Uh, in 18, 1807, the HMS Leopard uh, is going to attack the U.S. Well, it's going to come up alongside the USS Chesapeake. And it's going to claim that we have some British, uh, British, former British sailors on the Chesapeake. The Chesapeake captain is going to deny this. The leopard is going to open fire. And we're going to have some people killed here. Let's see. Three killed, 18 wounded. The British are going to board our ship, and they are going to take four people from us uh, and impress them back into service. Jefferson demands an apology. Like, look, we are not fighting you, Britain. What are you, what are you doing? We No, stop. The British do apologize for that one incident, but they keep the four sailors. <laughs> Jay's treaty. So... Jefferson comes up with this brilliant idea. We are going to embargo Europe. So embargo means a complete shutdown of the economy. We are not going to trade with Europe for any reason. We're just going to sit on our stuff. And, you know, Jefferson's idea here is that United States, we supply a lot, like a lot of, of raw material to Europe. So eventually... Europe's going to recognize this and go, oh, we're sorry, United States, we'll play nice. Well, that was the game plan. But Jefferson, he wasn't, he didn't quite understand how the mechanics worked. So he shut everything down over here. Britain was still trading with some of their islands. And France, at this point, was starting to own most of Europe with Napoleon. Uh, so they, they didn't really need us as much as we thought they would need us. Well, this really hurts the North and the South because we're not trading with anybody. We're just sitting here collecting more and more tobacco and more and more cotton and we're just, we don't have any place to, to put it. The people up in the North are building ships but nobody's buying them because we can't sell them because of the embargo. So the embargo hurts us arguably more than it hurt Europe. Well, it's not an argument. It, it hurt us more than it hurt Europe. All right. Jefferson uh, lasted for two president, uh, two terms. So he's out. So President Washington was two terms. John Adams is one term. President Jefferson, two terms. And now we have Madison. What do we know about James Madison? Well, he's the one, if you recall, he's the one that cheated, and he, he wrote down everything that everybody said as much as he could during the Continental Congress which when George Washington said, no, you're not allowed to write anything down, and he went back to his rooms, he wrote everything down instead of going to the bar like everybody else did. Um, advisor George Washington helped build the Democratic Republican Party with Thomas Jefferson. He was elected in 1808. All right. Um, he is going to try to get, he's going to try to get this embargo thing figured out. And so Napoleon is going to see that, uh, hey, if we start trading with the, with the United States, that's going to really irritate Britain. And so Napoleon's going to lift his sanctions, and so we're going to, we might start, to, and then the British, it's not going to work out. We're going to continue to have an embargo against Europe, and it's going to continue to hurt us, and Madison can't do anything about it. We have a group of people over here called the Warhawks. I guess in the year 2020, we have a group of people called the Warhawks as well. So we have the Warhawks and, and the War Doves. The War Hawks are people who are pro-military, and pro-doves would be obviously pro-non-military. Pro uh, the War Hawks, people who think that the military is the solution. Biggest, strongest, baddest person on the, on the block. Let's see, that would be, let's see, which philosopher is that? Uh, Thomas Hobbes, right? Yeah, people are deep down evil, right? Uh, so very na War Hawks, very nationalistic. They favor military response over diplomacy. And they start, they start looking at the map, and they're like, hey, you know these, these Native Americans over here? They're over here, and they're still arguing with us. And even though we took Louisiana, we bought Louisiana, and now we're trying to kick them out, 
and uh, we're having all these. The British, the British are helping them out. We need to handle this with the British. So that's what the war hawks are talking about. So, uh, a couple of uh, famous Native Americans, Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa. 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 Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa. Wait. Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa. Tenskwat, shoot. Tenskwat, I don't know, okay. We call him the prophet probably because we can't pronounce his name. The prophet, uh, Tecumseh and the, and the prophet. Yeah, you're like, right now you're like, that's so easy. It's Tenskwatawa. They are going to come up with an idea, the Native Americans guy, uh, guys, they're going to come up with this idea. They're going to say, let's, form, let's have a, a, uh, a confederation of all the tribes east of the Mississippi River. So between the Mississippi River and the Appalachian Mountains and form a giant confederation, kind of like the Articles of Confederation with the 13 states, and that didn't really work out. But confederation of Native American tribes, and then they can negotiate with the evil American, uh, the, the evil American empire. That was the game plan. And so, hey, that, that looks like that's going to, eh, it doesn't work because Native Americans are not going, because they have differences of opinions, and that is not going to be effective. Uh, General William Henry Harrison is going to take a group of American soldiers over to Indiana, and he's going to fight against uh, Tecumseh at the Battle of Tippecanoe. Tippecanoe, okay, you're going to remember this because it's, it's going to become a presidential campaign slogan. The Battle of Tippecanoe, attack, the attack led, uh, and that attack is going to begin a war between the Native Americans, not that we haven't had a war before, but begin a serious war between the Native Americans and the American government. The Native Americans being backed by the British, and so a lot of the war hawks are saying, well, I mean, we are fighting the Native Americans, but the Native Americans are being bought backed by the British, so therefore we're technically fighting the British too. And Madison's like, wait, what? So here we are, here we have the War of 1812. And we just have two slides here. The War of 1812, because we're not talking about the war, it's just the Senate, we call it Mr. Madison's War. Uh, let's see. Some, uh, let's see, the people of the East, so we're talking about the New England, right? New England, we're talking about Massachusetts and Connecticut and New York and that, that group, they did not want the war. One, they were pro-British. Two, they thought, um, if, we, if we go to war, then that's also Canada, because Canada is owned by the British at this point. If we go to war, we have to fight Canada, and then if we beat Canada and we take over Canada, we have Louisiana, and now we take over Canada, that's all farmland. And the people of the New England are like, that's way too many farmers because they, they're all going to vote Democratic or Republican, and we want the Federalists, and ah! So they don't want to play that game. Uh, let's see, so they don't, want, they don't want the war. However, in the South and the West, they absolutely want the war because they see this as, I mean, the Native Americans are going after their stuff, and so we've got to fight the British for it. So Congress declares war on June 1st of 1812. And what does Congress say about it? Congress says, we are declaring war, why? Because... The British keep impressing our sailors. They, we've been telling them to stop for, for 20 years at this point. They're also blockading, the, and the British are inciting Indians. And Congress, when they were talking to themselves, they were like, you know what, if we can fight Britain, then you know, we'll look like, ooh, the United States. We beat them once, maybe we can beat them twice, and then people will really pay attention to us. And Yeah, so we've got good credit, and our military is awesome. That was the game plan. Plus, obviously, we're going to do this. We just happen to be, declare war on Britain when Britain is fighting France. And, you know, France is doing really well over there with Napoleon. So it just happens that we're declaring war on Britain at that time. You know, it's not our fault that Britain's involved in lots of different wars at the same time. But <laughs> it is what it is. Was, the, was this war avoidable? It's interesting as we look back, you know, hindsight being 2020 in history, as we look uh, 2025 in history. British economy was beginning to suffer, actually, because of the embargo. <laughs> you know, Jefferson, Jefferson's plan kind of worked. It took a lot longer than he anticipated, but it started to have an effect on Britain. And so there's uh, various evidence out there that says that Britain was about to cave, that they were going to start allowing uh, to, to stop the embargo. They were going to start quit. They were going to stop quit. They were going to quit impressing our sailors. They were going to... 
uh, start trading with us and be nice about it. But we declared war. So it's too late. You know, we thought the war would be short. We thought it would be short. We thought, you know, we have all these people, and there's like, what, four people who live in Canada, so I mean, that can't be a big deal. And Britain was fighting France, so this should be in and out. We should declare victory here in a month and a half, and it will all be good, and we will be the United, the greatest country in the world. Nobody can defeat us, because we're 1-0 and right now. We're going to fight Britain again. We're about to be 2-0. and It's going to be great. Turns out... Uh, Britain's a little stronger than we thought. Their navy is like really good. Oh, also, um, they had a lot more people in Canada than we knew about, and plus their army in Canada was about the size of the army that we had in the United States, so awkward. Hey, that's the end of video number two. I'm gonna do video number three real fast. It's gonna be about uh, Marbury versus Madison. You want to stick around for that because that is a great story, plus it's really important in American history. Not that this stuff isn't, but it's really important that you see video number three. And, all right, be good. I'll see you in a second.